Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, we share what industrial stocks our ultimate stock pickers bought. David Blanchett addresses what today's low bond yields mean for retirement planning. Russ Kinnell breaks down the criteria for medalist ratings. And Christine Benz encourages investors to resist the urge to change their portfolios around the election. Let's get started. We share what industrial stocks our top managers bought last quarter. Each quarter, we take a look at the recent transactions of some of the top money managers around today, who we call our ultimate stock pickers. Last quarter, two stocks in particular were popular new money buys among the group. Who are new money buys? Stocks that managers purchased that weren't in their portfolios the prior quarter. Seven of our ultimate stock pickers bought Otis Worldwide, while five managers picked up Carrier Global. Otis is the largest global elevator and escalator supplier by revenue. Morningstar assigns the company a wide economic moat rating and a stable moat trend. Morningstar director Denise Molina notes that Otis benefits from high revenue visibility and a large portfolio of elevators under maintenance that provides a high degree of security of future orders. The business is also asset light, with few parts manufactured by the firm directly and assembly of equipment on the customer site. This model allows the company to generate high returns. We think shares have a fair value of $57 and think they're overvalued today. Carrier Global, meanwhile, is a lead supplier of climate control and fire and security solutions. It was spun off from United Technologies in April 2020. We assigned Carrier a narrow economic moat rating and a stable moat trend. Despite its debt burden, Carrier now has a narrow strategic focus and no longer must fight for capital from an increasingly aerospace-focused parent company. Morningstar director Brian Bernard says Carrier is well-positioned to benefit from expanding market opportunities related to the coronavirus. For example, demand for air filtration and touchless security access products. We think shares are worth $33 and are about fairly valued today. Six days a week, we deliver the latest news for investors. Just say, Alexa, enable the Morningstar skill, or visit Morningstar.com slash Alexa. Now, Christine Benz from Morningstar Inc. interviews David Blanchett from Morningstar Investment Management. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. What do today's low bond yields mean for retirement planning? Joining me to discuss that topic is David Blanchett. He's head of retirement research for Morningstar Investment Management. David, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So let's discuss this issue of really low bond yields. Um, What does it say about the role of bonds in a portfolio? I think some investors might be inclined to almost, you know, forget about them because it's really hard to see what the value is. How should investors think about bonds from a portfolio standpoint today? Yeah, I mean, first it's 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 incredibly depressing, right? You've got you know yields on ten-year bonds under one percent, and who knows how long they'll be there. And to your point, someone might say, "Well, David, I don't want to invest in bonds because they have a lower return." Well, you know, I would argue that in theory, you know, the return on stocks is the return on bonds plus some kind of equity risk premium. And so, I think for a lot of investors that have to achieve a certain rate of return. They might be less less interested in owning bonds, but I mean, bonds have always been that safe part of a portfolio. So, you know, I, I'm hesitant to tell someone to kind of move too much out of bonds to reach for return because they really are important to kind of ensuring, you know, diversification over the long haul. How about that at the other end of the spectrum, someone who might say, well, why not just cash, given how minimal that yield differential is today? Is that reasonable to maybe think about just getting out of bonds and moving those funds into cash instead? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see an argument for for lessening duration, right? There isn't a whole lot of um, premium these days for going way out on the on the duration curve with long maturity bonds. But I mean, if if you if you own cash, you're going to earn a zero percent rate of return, and so um, and that's again that's before. I mean, you won't get taxed on that. Um, but that's before fees and inflation. And so if you if you own cash, you are virtually guaranteed to earn less than inflation. If you own earn bonds, you probably will, but it's not for certain. So, you know, for me, I think that, you know, to your question, owning cash is maybe a little bit more attractive than it was before. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a boring long term strategic investor. So I would say that you still need a healthy slug of bonds in, a, in any kind of balanced allocation. 
Okay. So let's discuss this from a uh, sort of portfolio plan perspective. If I'm planning out my retirement or even my years until retirement and I have some sort of bond allocation, what's what's a reasonable return assumption? I know that you think it's a huge mistake to just extrapolate from past history uh, in terms of bond returns that people really need to be quite conservative, right? Yeah, I think that, that a lot of financial planners and a lot of financial planning tools, they use historical long-term averages as their return assumptions, right? The historical long-term average return on, on tenure government bonds is about a little over four and a half percent. That's about 4% higher than they are today. And so I think that, you know, if you're watching this and you, you are a financial planner, you've done a financial plan, you've got to first ask yourself, like, are, are my assumptions reasonable? And I don't know that, that returns will stay this low forever. I, I might argue they might, but I think it's important when you're, when you're modeling returns, they're reasonable. And so I don't think it's, I don't think, you know, you know for, for tenure government bonds, I think one or 2% for the next 10 years is pretty, is pretty reasonable. For aggregate, maybe three or 4%, but those are, those are really low numbers. And once you tack on, you know, volatility drain and fees and taxes, you are looking at, you know, a realized return that's pretty close to zero or negative. So let's talk about the implications for how someone actually thinks about their retirement plan, specifically talking about withdrawal rates. I know that you and some of your co-researchers have been saying that investors really ought to think about ratcheting down their withdrawal rate assumptions. Can you discuss what role low yields play in that overall guidance? Sure. So it, it's kind of funny. I wrote uh, some research with Wade Fowl and Michael Finca, I don't know, like five or six years ago. And we talked about this, this, this idea that, you know, a lot of the historical research, almost all of it at the time on safe withdrawal rates was based upon historical long-term averages. And we're like, hey, what if we have low interest rates for a while? And people would say, ah, this is just a short-term anomaly. You know, things will get back up, you know, soon. Well, we're actually lower today than we were five or six years ago. And I think that, that what it really requires is, is, revisiting your assumptions. And, you know, if you rerun the historical, you know, estimates that, that came out with a 4% safe withdrawal rate, well, you, you'd get a, a withdrawal rate that's, that's less than 3% today. Now, I actually think that 4% is, is fine for most people because most people have social security retirement benefits. They can, they can spend less they need to. But, you know, return is one of the biggest drivers of what you can spend from your portfolio. And if, if yields stay low for a long time, I think it's gonna have a pretty huge impact on both people who are accumulating for retirement, but also who are taking down money for to spend in retirement. And you made the point to me that uh, where yields are today affects a lot of other aspects of retirement planning as well. Let's talk about how that might inform someone's thinking with respect to social security filing. How, how, do, how do the two fit together? Right. So. Um, Social Security is kind of an anomaly in the world of guaranteed income where the, the payout doesn't change based upon prevailing yields. And so, you know, other, other forms of guaranteed income like private annuities, um, they actually become more attractive, relatively speaking, as interest rates fall. There's this thing called mortality credits. Um, they're actually kind of a better way to fund retirement when interest rates are low. But here's the thing about Social Security. When interest rates fall, the benefits don't fall as well. And so, like, it was, it was, it was a great thing let's just say a few years ago, now it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And so, I mean, if you can afford to do so, delaying Social Security is without a doubt the kind of most attractive way to kind of fund retirement today. Because you enlarge your eventual benefit. Well, yeah. So again, if, if, if you're, you know, it, it's, to me, the, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not an investment, but, you know, you earn a rate of return by delaying claiming Social Security. And when you delay claiming Social Security, you're actually earning an interest rate that's probably north of six or seven percent. And you, you just cannot get that today in any kind of market. And when you tack on the survivor benefits, the, the fact that it's, you know, attractively uh, tax, there's, it's, it's linked to inflation. Um, it's kind of the relative value of Social Security today versus anything else is so much larger because interest rates are so low. And you referenced annuities, David, but let's discuss that because um, you, I sometimes hear people say, well, interest rates are so low, why would I lock in an annuity now? But you just said that actually it's not as unattractive as it might seem. Can you talk us through that? Sure. So the key is relatively speaking, right? So if interest rates are low, the payout on annuities are lower. I mean, like they are linked to the same bonds that you would buy in your portfolio. 
But if you buy an annuity, you're also buying this, this thing called mortality credits. So and when I'm using the word annuity, I'm focused on income for life, not an accumulation vehicle. I'm focused on a product that creates income for you in retirement. And again, uh, there's two parts of that, of that you know, payout. One is what's called mortality credits, and one is what's called like the interest rate. Well, as interest rates have moved to zero, you still get the value of mortality credits when it comes to buying an annuity. So it's definitely true that interest rates have affected the payout rates on annuities, but they're actually kind of a more attractive investment today versus fixed income because you still earn that benefit of, of mortality risk pooling. Okay, David, big topic. Thank you so much for being here to discuss it with us. Sure thing. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar.com. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room, Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date, independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Next, Russ Kennel from Morningstar Research Services shares how funds qualify for medalist ratings. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. Where do index funds tend to dominate, and in which categories do active funds rule? Joining me to discuss that topic is Russ Kennel. He's Morningstar's Director of Manager Research. Russ, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Russ, uh, you are on the committee that gives out these medalist ratings to funds or that assigns funds medalist ratings. Before we get started on this topic, can you talk about um, some of the main ingredients that go into a fund qualifying for that medalist designation? Sure thing. Uh, so what the committees and, and the analysts uh, rating the funds are doing is assessing the management behind the fund, that's our people pillar, the strategy of the fund, that's the process pillar, the parent, uh, that's the fund company uh, behind that. And we're rating each one on a scale of one to five, so low to high. Uh, we take all of those uh, figures, uh, we rate them, decide uh, how the funds stack up, um, essentially based on, think about competitive advantages. Does this fund really have competitive advantages against its benchmark and peer groups. Um, and then we take all that information and then um, we assess, uh, we have uh, programs to assess uh, what's the uh, return uh, potential for that category. And then it subtracts, uh, and then it, using, using those pillars, it assigns uh, a value, uh, subtracts the fees for each share class to come up uh, with a rating. So essentially what we're saying is, we're looking at the fundamentals, uh, but then we're also looking at uh, returns and fees to come out uh, with an overall uh, analyst rating from uh, negative to uh, gold being the highest rating. So Russ, Morningstar.com premium users may have noticed that there are some categories where the medalists are mainly index funds, some where they are mainly active funds. International small and mid caps is an area where we have a lot of index fund medalists. And in a way, this seems like a category where active managers might actually be able to add some value. Can you talk about what's going on there? You know, it's, it's really interesting because, of course, generally people think of small and mid caps as being less efficient and a great place to invest. Uh, but know that it really is. That's really the result of uh, our ratings. It's not we're not really making a macro call. Uh, but there are a couple of factors uh, going on in, in this area. Uh, one is simply that the passive funds, uh, Vanguard and DFA are our gold rated funds in this area. Uh, they have a big fee advantage because, as you know, foreign small mid funds tend to charge a lot. Most of them uh, in their retail shares are going to charge well over 1%. Uh, their institutional might be a little below, but uh, they're, they're going to be pricier. Whereas if you look at uh, Vanguard, I believe is 11 basis points, uh, DFA is about 50. Uh, so there's a very big fee advantage. And given our methodology, that's, that's part of what you're seeing there is that uh, significant uh, fee advantage expressed in our ratings where only passive has gold analyst ratings. We do have some silver and bronze uh, actively managed funds, but you know, really it's just capturing the fact that there's maybe a bigger fee advantage in that category than there are in many categories. 
Municipal bonds are the opposite case. Russ, can you talk about that category, how there really aren't many index funds in that space and why you and the team do tend to favor active funds there? That's right. Well, I talked about the big fee advantage in uh, foreign small mid passive versus active. Uh, In munis, you have some very low cost, uh, actively managed uh, municipal bond funds. So it's much tighter, which makes sense because, of course, the the return and yield potential in in munis is modest. Um, But there's another element going on here, and that is that it's very hard to index municipal bonds um, because Uh, municipal bonds don't trade a lot. It's a retail market. In other words, municipal bonds are issued and they're largely bought up by individual investors and mutual funds, and then they're not traded a lot. So it's very hard to index uh, something that doesn't have that much trading. And so uh, we've got a couple of bronze rated index funds, but uh, generally it's an area there that passive has kind of ceded uh, to active. I'm sure they'll continue to challenge active, but right now they're just some uh, really good active funds and and they are, I think, able to add value uh, versus passive today. So uh, again, it's kind of interesting that here's a a maybe lower return area, but we actually like active uh, more than passive there. So just to clarify, uh, the ratings should not be read as sort of a top-down call uh, about where to go active or where to go passive. It's really based on where you see the best funds in each category. Exactly. I mean, you can, you can sort of, from this bottom-up process, it tells you something uh, about active versus passive. But yeah, that's not really what we're intending. And certainly if you see in, in many of our categories, you'll see uh, it's not as stark as these two examples we're giving you. So more commonly, you'll see some gold active and passive. Uh, but I think it's really interesting to see what this uh, bottom up process uh, can tell you about active versus passive as well. OK, Russ, interesting topic. Thank you so much for being here to share your thoughts. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. Lastly, Christine Benz and Susan Jabinski from Morningstar Inc. discuss investor behavior around the election. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. The election is right around the corner. Should investors be thinking about making any changes to their portfolios as a result? Joining me here today to explore the topic is Christine Benz. Christine is Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance. Christine, thanks for being here today. Susan, it's great to be here. Oftentimes, when people talk about elections, they talk about how well the stock market has historically performed under a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. Is is that something worth doing, exploring that question? Well, probably not, because when you look at the data on how the market has performed in various regimes, what you see is that the data are all over the map in terms of whether the market tends to perform well under Republican presidents or Democratic presidents. So I wouldn't rely on that as a gauge. And then I think when you take an even wider view, what you have to realize is that who is president is but a small determinant of how the market behaves. And right now we're contending with some really large forces beyond politics. We've got this pandemic. We're in the midst of a recession. We still have quite high unemployment. We have very low interest rates. We have not cheap equity valuations. So it's all mixed together in determining how the market will behave in the future. And so I really think that investors shouldn't get caught up in terms of trying to position their portfolio portfolios to benefit or potentially to protect them from one president or the other taking office. What about elections and market volatility? I mean, considering the uncertainty, is is volatility something investors should be bracing themselves for? Well, I do think that that is something investors should be thinking about. We have experienced some volatility recently in some of the technology stocks, but I do expect that we will see probably more volatility as we get closer to the election. For one thing, when you look at the data on polling, it's really quite tight. So my guess is that 
whoever wins this election, there will be kind of a surprise factor. So there will be an opportunity for some dramatic ups and downs around the, the final outcome. But I also come back to that phrase you often hear about how the market really doesn't like uncertainty. And right now we have a lot of uncertainty and we may have uncertainty even on and after election day because it sounds like there it may take a while to count some of the votes coming in. So investors should brace themselves for volatility. I would expect to see uh, more volatility in the next couple of months as we sort all of this out. So Christine, if the market goes up a lot prior to and through the election or, or down a bit, through that same period, investors shouldn't make too too much of it? I don't think so, because sometimes you do see these dramatic moves. If you'll remember, uh, right after President Trump was elected, we had an initial significant downdraft in the market, then it recovered. We had um, some strong returns for a period there, and then volatility as the, the pandemic came on. So I wouldn't uh, make too much of volatility in the months around the election. I, I would expect some of it, and it may not foretell how the market will perform over the president's whole tenure. So I wouldn't get uh, too worked up about volatility in these coming months. So lastly, then, is there really anything investors should be doing at this point with their portfolios? I really like the idea of bringing it back to your plan, bringing it back to the policies that you have for your plan. So I love the idea of investors working with an investment policy statement or some kind of blueprint that guides how they position their portfolios and guides when they make changes. For a lot of investors, they've probably been fairly hands off through their portfolios through this period. The data suggests that, in fact, they have. We haven't seen investors uh, flee from stocks despite some of the volatility that we experienced during the first quarter. But I would say bring it back to that plan, bring it back to your asset allocation target. If you have an asset allocation target, you may in fact be wanting to trim stocks, uh, especially if you're getting close to retirement. Um, similarly, many investors haven't addressed their portfolio's exposures with international stocks relative to U.S. Take a look at where you are in your positioning geographically relative to your targets. Also take a look at where you stand on the value to growth spectrum. There's another area where many investors have been hands off with their portfolios, all too, wit too willing to let their growth stocks drift up. Take a look at your portfolio's positioning on a bottom-up basis and consider rebalancing back to your policy positions. I think that that's probably the best course of action for most investors at this juncture. So let your own policy drive your portfolio even today. Exactly. Christine, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services LLC is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.